Another blood red sunset and yet another moon face and still another hundred miles to my next resting place Driving down the road eyes on the horizon Within my car I'm all alone But feeling good and feeling strong Knowing that this path I'm on brings me to myself I'm driving Hey now all, I'm Joey C. Welcome back to another episode of Spirit Sherpa. This is the show that helps and encourages you on your journey to unlock your magic mojo. With me, as always, is the spirit doctor, Kelly Sparta. Hey, Kelly. Hey, Joey. How's it going? It's going really well. I made my move to Virginia and life is just happy go. Yeah. Now you're in Virginia and this is this is important, I think, for the listeners to know, because this is a little bit different feel for the recordings than we've done in the past. Yeah, well, you're you're in Massachusetts and I'm in Virginia, and we have a guest on the call today for calling in from Michigan too. We so. do have a guest. We are covering the globe, as it were, but not really the globe, not just really. the US. Yeah, we're gonna have to work on your global concepts. Hey, yes. I'm just trying to make it feel bigger than it is. <laughs> okay, Come on. all right, we'll work on that. <laughs> so let's invite the guest in and let's welcome Kathy Shiren here with us. Now, you've talked about Kathy a number of times, and then we're going to let you sort of tell that story. But first, let's introduce Kathy. Kathy is part of your shamanic training program. And Kathy, you've been practicing ritual and transformational dynamics for about 30 years now. Is that right? Yep. Um, 30 and counting. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> so you did your PhD dissertation on effectively on ritual. Yep. The uh, title of the dissertation was Transformational Dynamics, the Study of Change in Human Systems. Um, basically, I was looking at what helped people make real change in their lives. And ritual was a key component of that process. So I did an extensive study of ritual as part of my dissertation. That's pretty cool. Can people actually read that? Is it online? Uh, <laughs> well, the um, in studying change... What happens is uh, my dissertation committee got kind of freaked out because just reading it was causing change to happen in their lives. And so um, they, my committee kept quitting. <laughs> so I had to get a new committee and then a new committee. And it was, I think I was on the third committee before I finally got graduated. And so nobody was stopping me from writing what turned out to be three dissertations in one. So it is available. It can be downloaded as a PDF, but it's 640 pages, which is not something most people want to wade through. So I'm actually in the process of turning the key components into a book, and um, I hope to have that out sometime in the next year or so, so that uh, people can not have to wade through all the academic speak and 640 pages to get the real essence of what the research was all about. Oh, that's fantastic. I think people will be pretty excited to hear about that when it comes out. (laughs) So Kelly, why don't you, why don't you tell us a story about how the two of you met? Well, it's a funny story. I was on walkabout and I met Kathy on her front stoop. I have to actually start a little further back in order to explain how I got there, which is I was at Brushwood in upstate New York and I ran into a woman in the bathroom and offered to braid her hair and we ended up talking and told her I was on walkabout and she said, well, you really need to go to this event called Spiral in Atlanta. And I said, sure, great. That sounds awesome. And I went, well, but wait a minute. Do they have a work study or something? Because I am on walkabout. I'm living on 350 bucks a month and the kindness of strangers. And I've got enough money to pay for gas to get there, but I don't have any money left after that. And she said, well, it's interesting because I was supposed to go and I set aside money to go. And now I can't. So if you will go, I will give you the money to go. And I said, that would be fantastic, right? And so uh, I had to follow her from Brushwood, New York, down to uh, her house in Kentucky, in Lexington, Kentucky, which is right over the border from where Kathy used to live in Cincinnati. And it turns out that she and this woman's boyfriend were car- were uh, carpooling to Atlanta. And so I was caravanning with them. And so I stayed with them and then showed up on Kathy's doorstep to pick her up. And that's where we met. And we ended up rooming together at Spiral. And by the time the end of that event happened, we were looking at each other going, we're going to be working together. We don't know when it is, but we're going to be working together. And uh, we did a an event 
in 2007. We yep. did a retreat and then we did, uh, we started working together more regularly in 20, was it 2012 or 2013, Kathy? I think it was 2013. 2013. Yeah. So we've been working together pretty consistently for the last five years, but we've been friends the whole time. And the rest, as they say, is history. Yes, indeed. <laughs> All right. So let's get into the content that we want to talk about for the listeners today. And it's probably not a big surprise to anyone, but we're going to talk about rituals today. Ritual is, and, and Kathy, you jump in whenever you feel like it, obviously. Let's just say there are different kinds of ritual. Let's start there. Okay. So right. there, there are rituals that are markers of things that are changing. So marriage, death, birth, you know, these are things that we think of. There's there's coming of age rituals, which in Jewish culture, you have the bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah, which are coming of age rituals. But a lot of us in, in the U.S. don't have a lot of ways in which we identify when we go from being a child to being an adult, which is the coming of age piece. We use ritual to say, yes, you have achieved this graduation from high school, graduation from college. These are all rituals that we are all used to. Now, when we talk transformational ritual, that's when we step into a different boat. So when you get into transformational ritual, you're looking more at how do you take your insides, bring them onto the, into the outside world and interact with them. That's what we're trying to do as ritualists in a transformational ritual environment is provide you with a chance to shift your identity through a series of experiential processes. I want to add that there's a there's another use of the word ritual, which people may be familiar with, and it is not in the context of what we're talking about. And that's where people talk about, oh, my morning ritual. You know, I get up, I have my cup of coffee, I brush my teeth, whatever is the, the morning process. Um, ritual is a word that has been used to indicate a pattern of something occurring in a certain order. And the kinds of rituals you were mentioning, um, bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah, those types of things, are standardized processes where rituals to create that transformational space have then been standardized. So it starts out as a standardized process. And then they get created to do certain things that then get repeated over and over and over again. The transformational ritual component that we do is we're literally creating rituals, um, using basic structures and creating rituals to elicit a certain type of transformation or a certain type of growth or change for the people who participate. So it's, it's, uh, it's kind of like customized creation of transformation using a ritual process. Yeah, it's actually entirely customized because um, when Kathy and I do it specifically, uh, we will actually, even if we've run this particular ritual before, we will actually tap into every single person who's registered for that ritual into their energy field and test each of the points of transformation within that, that ritual we have designed and make sure that it will work for every single person who comes through the process. And if it doesn't, then we will substitute a different piece for that that part of the ritual that didn't work for that person's energetic. So it is entirely customized, even when we have something that's, that's, uh, you know, something we've done in the past. So um, it's, it's a very personalized process. So do you have an example to, for the folks who might not have gone through this before and might not really have a feel for what it means beyond like what you said before, Kathy, there quote the morning ritual or something like that. Do you have an example of something that the two of you do with regards to ritual uh, that will kind of give people some perspective? Well, so I have an example of a ritual that I can, can describe for you. It's not one that I ran with Kathy, but uh, the reason that I'm not going to give you one that Kathy and I have done together is because one of the biggest elements of, of doing this kind of ritual is not knowing what's coming. Because if you know what's coming, then you your resistance can kick in, right? Okay. Yep. And so I'm not going to describe one of our events because then that destroys part of the efficacy of it. Okay. But I will tell you about an event that that I ran with 
when I went on walkabout, I met someone who then subsequently went on his own walkabout and came up to Massachusetts where I was living at the time. And all my friends were saying, well, can you, can you tell us what it's like to be on walkabout? And I said, no, but I can give you an experience of what it's like to be on walkabout. And they said, well, yeah, that'd be great. And so he and I and another woman that I, I worked with, we put together a ritual so that they would be able to experience what it was like to be on walkabout. And so we, we began them in a living room and uh, set a bunch of rocks in front of them and said, you know, pick a rock that, that works for you and then take all of your hopes and dreams for the future and imbue them in the rock. And when you feel like you've gotten everything imbued, then come down the stairs and knock on the door at the bottom of the stairs. And so they did that one by one and they were instructed to not be next to the door when the person was going through. And um, so the, they would come downstairs and knock on the door and the woman would answer the door and she would give them a challenge question, which said, when you step out in to a walkabout. You are stepping out in faith. You are surrendering to the universe and trusting that the universe is going to give you not necessarily what you want, but what you need. And so I'll take that rock now. And for some people, this was like a meltdown moment because what do you mean I have to give up my rock? These are the things that I want. All the, all the control factors kicked in. For other people, they went, oh, that makes sense. And they handed it over. No big deal. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, this is how it becomes personalized, right? Is because everybody has their own response to these experiences. And then she would hand them over to me and I, would say, look, when you step out in faith, you don't get to see the path ahead of you. You have to take each step and trust that I will not let you fall. And so I put a blindfold on them and we went out on a trust walk and I took them outside into the yard. I had them walk across rocky ground where I would hold them very strongly to make sure they didn't fall. I took them across very smooth grassy ground and led them by a single fingertip I had them interact with a rock and just sit still for a minute. I took them out into a wooded area and left them there and walked away for 30 seconds and then called to them and had them come to me to the sound of my voice. And then I said, okay, you have learned how to follow. Now it's time to learn how to lead and trust that I will not let you fall. And then they would lead. So for, for many of the people, it was just walking around. One person turned around and started dancing with me. You know, it, it was just a matter of the person as to how they did that. And then I brought them back to the stairs to bring them up to the deck to come back into another part of the living room for the end. And there's always an insert miracle here portion that we don't plan, but the universe provides. And so what I discovered as the people debriefed at the end was that when I led them up the stairs, I was walking backwards and I had their hands on top of mine flat, you know, one so that they would feel where I was going. And for the first few steps, as I walked backwards, they thought I was levitating. <laughs> And so that was really cool. And then they hit the stairs and realized what was going on. But, um, and so I led them backwards up the stairs and placed them in front of the guy who was in town on his own walkabout. And he pulled the, the mask off, handed it to me, and I went back to start over. But he looked at them. Now they've been in the dark for, you know, five, seven minutes at this point. And it's bright light outside. So it takes them a minute for their eyes to adjust. And then they realize that it's not me standing in front of them. And now they're questioning where did the transition take place? And his message was, the universe has many faces and messages come from many places. I invite you to come in and have a seat and contemplate in silence your experience. So we went through that whole process. We took 12 people through the process. And at the end, you, you debrief and you talk about it. And that's where people get to see what their response was to the exact same series of events that someone else had another response to, which is educational. And one of the guys had been complaining for months that the universe was not talking to him. And he was very frustrated that he was just not getting messages and he felt like he'd been abandoned and all this stuff. He was the only person in the group who where I dropped them in the woods and had them come to the sound of my voice. I literally screamed his name and he did not hear me. And I had to go and get him. Hmm. So that was, you know, when, when I am standing in that space and representing the universe, 
you will have the interaction with me that you have with the universe, right? So, you know, and he wasn't hard of hearing in any way. And I didn't walk any further away from him than I did to everybody else. And everybody else, I just said, hey, come over here. And I was very soft. And with him, I'm going, hi. (laughs) And he didn't hear me. So there's a question in there of, is the universe not talking to you or are you not listening? Exactly. And so that was his aha from that experience. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is the sort of thing that you get from these sorts of experiences as you get to have the experience itself. And if you were imagining as I was walking you through that process, how you would have felt, you're getting a sense of what it's like to have been in it. And then the the debrief process of seeing how different people had different experiences is informational as well, because that shows you where your stories kicked in versus the experience you could have had, right? Mm-hmm. Now, you've mentioned the debrief process a couple of times, and it seems to be important. Is that sharing of the experience, uh, especially if you've done the the ritual with a group, important for your own uh, recognition of what happened as well? We have found it to be yes. I mean, I, I didn't start out getting the PhD in ritual. I started out actually learning from a shaman and co-creating ritual and then building a ritual group and then doing regular rituals and holding transformational intensive events, all that. So the, the PhD came afterwards when I wanted to have some research on, well, okay, we have all this experiential process that we have through experience learned that worked. Um, and now what does the literature say about that? What does the research say about that? So that's kind of how I sort of backed into the PhD. But one of the things that we found that were really important was the debrief at the end of the process. Usually not immediately, you know, if you'll notice in the story that um, in the ritual that Kelly described, uh, they were to sit and contemplate their experience. So there was some time for them to experience it, to integrate it, to think it through before they then sat down and shared their experience. But in the sharing of the experience, it deepens and enriches the experience for all of them. It helps them anchor into themselves and integrate more fully their own experience. And it deepens the experience for everyone when they hear the different types of experiences, the different nuances, the different ways in which people respond. The <laughs> I remember, I'm not going to describe the ritual, it's too long to go into and I won't do that, but um, it was a counterintuitive ritual. And by that, I mean that the ritualists were there to get in your way, but people weren't told that. Mm-hmm. So the the successful completion of the ritual was to tell the ritualist to get out of the way and do what it was you were told you were there to do. But that isn't the way rituals usually work. It's a very counterintuitive process. And so when we were doing the debrief afterwards and people were talking about that aha moment that they had when they understood that they could move forward, they didn't need anybody else's approval or blessing or whatever, and they could just move past these people that were getting in their way, that it was a powerful moment for them. And this one guy sat there and listened to it all. And he said, oh, I get it now. He said, I just thought you all were bad ritualists. (laughs) So for him, his aha moment came in the debrief. And sometimes you also need to be witnessed. You know, if you had a really powerful experience and you don't share that with others and, and have it witnessed, it's easy to talk yourself out of the belief that it happened at all. And so being witnessed is an important element for some people in, in some instances of, of transformation. Also confirmed. Yeah. Because you may think I'm the only crazy person that that happened to. And as you listen to the debrief and other people say this happened to me and somebody else said, Oh, that happened to me too. You can, you can sit there and know, ah, I'm not alone. Right. You know, that this is a shared experience. Other people experience it the same way I do. And sometimes it's a, look, I'm special because I had a different experience than everybody else. So, you know, it could be that as well. I have many times in the course of going through other people's rituals had experiences that were not on the scheduled docket. (laughs) I'm like, I know Hearn's over there waiting to talk to me. I'll, I'll be with you in a minute. I'm going to talk to the fairy queen who is on the stump right now. You know? <laughs> like... Are there standard components of rituals that you put in place? Or are they truly, um, as you mentioned before, customized for the audience? The answer to that is yes and yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, there, is, there is a basic framework. Mm-hmm. 
that all powerful ritual incorporates. And any piece of the framework that's missing tends to undermine somewhat the efficacy of the ritual. Okay. And then there is the content or the intention that you place within that framework. So the framework's, you know, pretty universal. That was one of the things that came out of my dissertational research. But the content then is, is your own. What's your intention? Who are the people that are coming to your event, like Kelly mentioned before? Um, what type of experience are you looking for them to have? And then when you take those intentions and that content and design within the framework, you end up with a very powerful transformational experience. But yeah. you need both, the basic framework and. And I, I'm going to give you a different kind of example for that one. And that is um, I went to a, an event that was supposed to be about helping women of all ages feel more beautiful about themselves and their bodies. And this was not by somebody who was trying to do a ritual. This was somebody who did Hollywood type of remake to help people feel good about themselves, women in particular. And she did a fabulous job. Of course, at that point, I knew what the model was. She did a fabulous job of bringing everybody into the space and, and the, the right kinds of experiences and the right kind of content. And I'm thinking, wow, I'm in the middle of a transformational ritual. This is awesome. <laughs> and she dropped the back part, the closing, the end piece that was so critical to making sure that the whole experience was taken in and, and able to be integrated. And I knew what had happened because I was aware of the model. She didn't because she didn't realize that she was in the middle of the model. And all the participants were feeling kind of abandoned, unsettled, unhappy. It's like, wait, this was so good. And, and you know, they just didn't understand why they didn't feel good at the end. I did. So I could fix it for myself, but I was a participant. So it wasn't my job to fix it for anybody else. If you understand what the framework is, you can make that kind of, you can either choose to be in it and use it effectively, or you can choose not to be in it and keep things at a more surface level, which is still very, can be very wonderful, mm -hmm. but doesn't leave people sort of discomforted at the end of the process. Yeah. Well, I just want to say one more thing about the process of designing it, because there are a couple of pieces that people don't necessarily look at if they're new to designing ritual. And one of those is what is the metaphor that you're going to use? Um, and I'll come back to that because it is dependent upon what are the steps that you have to take in order to get from where people are to where you want them to go. And how do those steps operate? When you know what the steps are, then you can choose an appropriate metaphor to go along with it. So when I was looking at the, the walkabout ritual, well, what is walkabout? Well, walkabout is a, a leap of faith. It is a stepping out into the world and allowing the universe to bring you where you're going to go. It's a surrender process. Okay. So when I'm surrendering, what does that mean? You know, how, how can I physically represent the act of surrender? Well, a trust walk, a blindfolded trust walk is a great way to physically represent the act of surrender and the giving up of your control over the process is a great way to represent the act of the surrender. You see how I'm saying? Yep. So it's, you're choosing a metaphor to go along with it. So, you know, that's a very broad stroke and the metaphors you choose and the paths you take and everything else are very specific to each individual scenario, but that's the general construct overview, you know, 500 foot view of how you would think about it. And you have to look at how it, it flows. You know, right. I helped a, a man who was designing a ritual for a burning man. And um, he had, he was going to put a hundred and they figured about 150 people would attend. He had a good metaphor and he had good steps, but he had a choke point in the middle where people had to go through something one by one. And for the person in the experience in that moment, it was great. But for the 149 people that hadn't been through it yet, they were kind of standing there going thumb twiddling. And for the last guy through, he was, you know, his experience would have been a lot of waiting and then his experience and 149 people on the other side would be going, what's next? We had to undo his choke point to shift how that particular experience happened to allow 150 people to flow through it in a more easier way. So people didn't get, so the energy of the, the process didn't get stuck and the flow continued and people didn't get bored or check out. Yeah. So how you design for a, a group of 12 is very different than how you design for a group of 150. 
so when you're doing that uh, ritual planning, there's also the element of logistical uh, considerations that needs to go into that structure as well. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and that includes physical environment. Right. You know, if you're going to be indoors or outdoors, if you're going to be in a nice space or a space that could be boggy and wet and marshy. And, you know, we, we worked with another woman who was uh, putting together a, a program for a uh, for women who were stepping into their priestess selves and uh, she had a physical location that was walking across a bridge and we had to work with the archetypal constructs that go with crossing a bridge, right? Because that's a transformational point. When you cross a bridge, there's symbology that exists within our cultural construct that says a bridge is a, a marriage between two places. It is a transition from one place to another. It is a crossing point. It is in sometimes a danger point. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we had to, to take into account the physical environment in which she was going to be structuring it so that uh, we made sure that that was in alignment with the piece of the ritual that she wanted to do there. A properly constructed framework with powerful content um, anchored metaphor and the logistical piece of it generates profound, just profound transformational experiences for people. It almost makes me inarticulate because people have said so many powerful things about lives changing in huge ways from these kinds of experiences. So if anything, I just want to emphasize that when this is done right, it's an incredible tool for powerful transformation. There's an added benefit when you're stepping into a ritual space, especially if it's within a retreat environment, it's amplified in that space. And that is that you're stepping out of your everyday roles and the expectations that are placed upon you as a person in your everyday life. And when you can separate from those things, you free yourself to make trans transition and transformation at a much deeper level. And when it's done within this environment, you can, at your choice, take a shallow dive, a medium dive, or a really deep dive and make transformation that I really honestly feel cannot be made in other, other environments in the same space of time because you have all these other things energetically holding you in place. And so, you know, it, it's one of the saddest things to me that our culture doesn't really have a reference point for it. Because when I try to explain to people what it is that we do within this retreat transformation environment, uh, people just don't have a point of reference. So they don't understand how amazingly powerful this work is. So when we talk about the ritual like we have here, it's it's very clear that it's incredibly important for the uh, transformational journey that we're all going through. But as we're talking to the bright and shinies here, <laughs> it seems to me that this isn't something that intention is enough. We've talked about that, Kelly, how many times, right? Throughout right. the course of the show, it's intention. But this has a structure around it that really allows it to be effective Yes. In a way that you need to be trained for. This isn't something you can just want to do and go out and do. You, you, it does help to have some specialized training here. Yes, that is very true. I have been to uh, any number of poorly designed rituals. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, you know it when you go through it because it sort of leaves you flat. So, yeah, it, it definitely does require a level of training and a level of, of knowledge. When we train ritualists, we require that they go through our process of getting rid of, or, you know, or a lot of their personal issues enough so that they don't get triggered at a state where they have to respond in the moment so that they can be safe containers for other people. Because when people are walk walking through transformational space, you, you have to expect that their stuff is going to come out. That's, that's what we're there for. We're there to bring their stuff out. And so if you as the ritualist have not done your own work, then you cannot hold safe space for someone else. And then, and only then, 
will we begin to teach them the process of how to walk other people through these sorts of experiences? Because we don't want people misusing the knowledge. It's like we're, we're handing you a nuclear power plant. I'm not going to let you walk in and just start flipping switches before you've studied how nuclear power works and know how not to blow yourself up and everyone around you. You know, it's that sort of, it's that level of knowledge that we work with. And so, you know, it is literally a three year process to learn to be a ritualist and a four year process to learn how to do the designing of the ritual and become a transformational shaman yourself. So it's not, a, it's not for the faint of heart, <laughs> but when you're done, you know, with absolute integrity and authority that, that you are safe and solid and that you will provide amazing experiences for other people. And that, that definitely it goes to what we've talked about all along here, which is creating safe spaces. And it sounds like as ritualists, um, you will become uh, not only the creators of that safe space, but the safe space itself. Yes. That is all that we have time for for this week. Is there anything that either of you want to say as a last word? If you haven't tried ritual, try it. <laughs> I mean, get out there and have some experiences. Get a sense for what works for you and what doesn't. I think Kelly said it earlier, which is that it's just sad that people don't really have a context for what it is a lot of the time that we're trying to explain to them about what it is that we do. Getting some experience will start to provide that context. Yeah. And if you don't like it with one person, go to somebody else's because uh, there's a lot of different ranges of experience and skill level. And just because somebody knows the structure of a particular type of ritual doesn't mean that they're actually doing the energetics of it. So, you know, if you don't like it with one person, try somebody else. Don't don't say I don't like ritual. Ain't that the way of the world? Yeah. Okay. Folks, be sure to join us next time as Kelly adds another chapter into your beginner's guide to energy, magic, and the spirit world. I'm Joey C. here with Kelly Sparta and Kathy Shiren, and you have been listening to Spirit Chirpa. Good night, everyone. Bye. Each mile Bye. I travel over 13,000 now, so I leave behind a little fear. Spirit Chirpa is a sole property of Kelly Sparta Enterprises and is distributed under Creative Commons BY-NC-ND 4.0 license. For more information about this licensing, please go to creativecommons.org. Any requests for deviations to this licensing should be sent to K-E-L-L-E at K-E-L-L-E-S-P-A-R-T-A dot com. That's Kelly at KellySparta.com. To sign up or to get more information on the programs, offerings, and services referenced in this episode, please go to KellySparta.com. This episode of Spirit Sherpa has been produced by Honu Voice Productions. Thank you.